I'm very pleased that we're doing this uh, ADA celebration. It's been 25 years, uh, and so we have some honored guests here today, and I'm glad to have all of you here. My name is Jim Thayer. I'm with the um, Mayor's Advisory Committee on People with Disabilities, and uh, right here we have the rest of the group, and in, in the idea of efficiency here, because you're on your lunch hour. None of you are working, right? You're on your lunch hour. Uh, yeah. So I'm, I'm going to hand the mic to Mark. That was hard to say. I'm going to hand the mic to Mark and let him say what it is we do on this committee. So, and then hopefully the mayor will be down here in a minute. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, our committee uh, encompasses a lot of uh, different departments within the city of St. Paul, different businesses within the, in the city of St. Paul. When the we've done some things with the Science Museum, uh, the Excel Energy Center, the home of the Minnesota Wild. We were instrumental when that. Uh, first open as far as accessibility. The St. Paul Saints Stadium, uh, we were at the first game where Mayor Coleman threw out the first pitch, and we're uh, working on that. The uh, As I just said, the Science Museum, and we also got the first audible uh, street light in St. Paul. So that took some doing, but we got it done. Then Dave Thune, who's going to be retiring, is... Um, we did, this, we did the sidewalk patio cafe with him. That took us 13 months, but we got a lot of city council expertise on how to perform in front of the St. Paul City Council. So our uh, little committee uh, encompasses a lot of things in, in St. Paul, and we are led by our great mayor, uh, Christopher Coleman, who was instrumental in the uh, St. Paul Saints uh, Stadium and did throw out the first pitch. So I'd like to, I see that he's here now, and I'd like to introduce him today as our featured guest speaker with us for this few comments on the Americans with Disabilities Act. Welcome, Mayor Coleman. Well, good, good afternoon, everyone. I am, uh, I, I'm, I'm really glad to be here and uh, so grateful for all of you in the room that have supported our work around accessibility. Uh, uh, Senator Durenberger, thank you so much for your leadership on this issue. And uh, you know, these, these things are difficult to get past. Uh, they're difficult once they're passed to, to uh, actually get implemented. Um, but when you have a commitment on, a, on the part of the community uh, to, to do right for all members of our community, uh, to, to make sure that we are a welcoming community for all, uh, then you do the th kinds of things that we did around the same stadium. Uh, you know, the same stadium, uh, I really think that uh, it has been the example uh, that will be set, uh, just in case there's another stadium being built in the city of St. Paul sometime <laughs> soon. Uh, and, 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 and maybe, maybe this time we can, we can even do it one better uh, and have that be the newest, most accessible stadium uh, in the entire country. Uh, and wouldn't that be an incredible gift? Um, but that's, that happens though because, because it reflects a community value. It, it happens because uh, we as a community, whether it's through, through Jesse's uh, work in, in Hero uh, and, and uh, others that have been, uh, I know Alyssa has been uh, a key part of that and, and just so thankful. Um, but, uh, but ultimately, the, my advisory committee that uh, all of you, uh, that, you know, that, that help raise the awareness of accessibility issues to help us understand uh, what we need to do, you know, as we're as we're rebuilding our streets uh, to make them, you know, when we talk about 880, uh, you know, the concept behind 880 uh, is that we build our our streets and our public spaces for eight-year-olds and 80-year-olds, and if we do that with with eight and 80-year-olds in mind, then we build a community uh, in in our public places and spaces uh, for all, and that includes people with access issues. And so, uh, I'm just so grateful for for the 25 years uh, of finally doing uh, things. You know, it, it, we we almost take this for granted, uh, and then you go travel to other countries or even, quite frankly, other cities. Uh, and you know it's it's uh, it's very difficult sometimes for a fully able-bodied person uh, to get around, uh, and you really uh, kind of understand. You know, when I go over to Europe or we're just over in Asia, and I and I think about the challenges that people with disabilities would find in those, and so so we shouldn't take for granted what we have accomplished here uh, and the great work that we're doing in the city of St. Paul. We know we need to do better. 
we know that there's more to do, uh, but I think that by the, by the example that we set uh, just with the CHS field, uh, we know that when we put our minds to it, we can do great things. So congratulations on 25 years of the ADA. Uh, here's to uh, the work continuing on making sure that we are a community that is open for all, accessible for all, and reflects the values of our community. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, we're very lucky in the city of St. Paul that uh, we have a mayor and a city council that actually is very sensitive to uh, the disability issues. And I know that whenever we ask anyone from any department or anything to come to our meetings, they're there. That tells you right there that they're very sensitive to the issues. So um, in the idea of keeping this going here, I want to uh, introduce our next two speakers, and we're very honored to have them here to talk about uh, the American with Disabilities Act, or let's just say ADA, just to keep things short. Um, and I'm going to read uh, my introduction here so I don't goof up you. <laughs> so we have, st <laughs> so, uh, we have Steve Moore here. And Steve, I, I got here, you were on the Capitol Hill for 30 years. Right. I haven't like done it? anything for 30 years, so I'm glad you two were I did that. I started when I was 11. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> During the time of ADA, he was actually working with Senator Durenberger as a legislative director, so thank you. Uh, senator Durenberger was actually um, three times uh, elected as a senator from Minnesota, and he passed laws such as Women's uh, Economic Equity Act, uh, Medicare Catastrophic Act, and obviously ADA, which you're here to talk about. Uh, and so what I'd like to do is pass it to you, and as you know, uh, we, we, we're on a time constraint, but I thought I'd start out. Um, you can ask questions if you want, but I thought I'd start out with this, and I know that any legislation, e even good legislation, which is this has an opposition, uh, were there community events that took place and things that helped you get this passed? Well, uh, I'm glad we started with the mayor, and I'm glad the mayor said what he said about all of you and all the rest of us who are residents of St. Paul, because... Um, Nobody goes to Washington and learns anything as important as how do you deal, whether it's women's equity, equity or it's disability, or it's health care for everyone, or education of the highest quality, whatever it may be. You don't learn that in Washington, D.C. You know, you learn that someplace. And I'm the luckiest guy alive because I born, raised, lived in Minnesota, and now I live in the good old St. This great neighborhood we call St. Paul. So, and I think the mayor has said it all when he when he thanked all of you for the work on the stadium and the lights and everything else in this city that most of us know nothing about. You know that that you were able to accomplish simply by your influence and your your ability to to reach to the highest levels of this this uh, community. And um, so, the only thing I'd like to say about the ADA is that it had to happen. And I'm glad it happened on my watch. And that the groundwork for it was laid by others. You know, Lowell Weicker, whom Steve worked for as well. By Tom Harkin, the Democrat who's had the sign, who was learned signing from his brother, who needed him to learn signing because he was deaf. And on and on and on and on with stories like that. But everything I learned, I learned because I was raised in this state. I was raised by people who cared about other people and who saw everyone in their lives as an opportunity to learn something, to be better than they were before. I was taught that in grade school. I was taught that in high school. I learned that in college. And I learned it even in the politics of my day. I wish I could say the same thing about the politics of today. But it only makes, it makes more important the fact that that law has been passed and that it has been implemented without going to the Supreme Court and you know a whole bunch of things like that. And because I had somebody working with me as my legislative director who, you know, Alyssa had the good judgment of marrying his son. <laughs> and we've all benefited <laughs> that way from the fact that he married a wonderful lady from Cambridge, Minnesota, which brought him from Connecticut via Washington, D.C. to us here in Minnesota, Steve Moore. Well, I just thinking back on the ADA, it's like it was, remember the old movie Camelot? A one brief shining moment that the ADA was a brief shining moment. It was this kind of opportunity 
that we had to be involved in a bill that was sweeping in its impact, potentially incredibly controversial because it was impacting so many people's lives. And it's a bill that went through the United States Senate with seven no votes. No major court challenges afterwards. No big need to go and clean up that and clean up that because we had so many people, we had so many pairs of eyes and hands and hearts invested in that bill. Anyone that's ever fished in northern Minnesota knows our great fish that people go after is the muskie. And it's called the fish of a thousand casts. You cast a thousand times in hopes of catching one. Well, the ADA was the bill of a thousand meetings. Yeah. We had a thousand meetings, point by point, as we made our way through the ADA. Republicans and Democrats, activists and people in the administration, lawyers and regular people. We had a thousand meetings. And it's not like we didn't have anything else to do. <laughs> yeah, we had right. foreign policy and tax policy and education and so forth. But it was just, and, and I would say uh, from my part and your part as well, uh, it was getting to know the disability community. Yeah. And we said, for this group of people, the quality of these folks, we can't treat this like a regular piece of legislation. This legislation needs our very, very, very best. Our best brains, our best heart, our best efforts. And to kind of go through that experience and to be on the Senate floor and have that thing kind of go through with seven no votes and have had such a history afterwards. We worked so incredibly hard on it, but it was all a great joy. I lament the politics of these days where... Uh, what could you pass with only seven no votes these days? Yeah. Something completely innocuous. Pass the salt or pepper, maybe. But right, it's uh, <laughs> uh, Senator Klobuchar's bill on uh, laundry detergent. Pods. Yeah, right. <laughs> but to be do something as big and as important and as nation chaining and world changing as the ADA, and to do it basically with a consensus, and I can tell you that right up to the last minute, we were still trying to win over those last seven votes. Yeah. We still we want to do everything we could to have all uh, all hundred senators on board, but so the quality of the work product that 25 years ago, and little did we know that shortly after that, that was September 7th, 1989, and shortly after that, we had Newt Gingrich and the Contract of America come to town, and we had the government shutdown, and we had Monica Lewinsky, and we had impeachment. And we had the Florida recount. And we had weapons of mass destruction. On and on and on. A bunch of shocks to the system which have pushed everybody into these neutral corners to come out fighting. And we got to experience kind of this Camelot moment when Republicans and Democrats were 100% together, united, equal, and trying to get something done for the good of the whole country. So we kind of hope and pray and dream that what we experienced may be out in our future someday. We lived it once, and it can happen again. Okay. So who has, wants to start asking the questions? Um, the boss. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's a kind word. Thank you very much. Um, my question is this. As the 25 years anniversary of the ADA has come and gone, is there any changes to the ADA looking back that you think could be made because technology has changed uh, so much? Well, um, Steve just gave you a, this quick study of what's happened in the last 25 years. Uh, he referred to it as a, the, the time in uh, 1989 as a Camelot moment. But he told you before that how hard everybody had to work to get to a Camelot moment. Absolutely. And so it's not like it wasn't a lot of effort. We had a Democratic president and a House and a, excuse me, a Republican president with a House and a Senate that were Democrat. And so the challenge of getting to that Camelot moment or to those heights or to getting even those last seven votes was still a really substantial challenge. But nobody who's ever legislated anything, including anything as big as this, believes 
that that law can't be improved. That the policy grows with the way the community grows, the way technology grows, the way the incentives that are now provided to all Americans, you know, to, to work to their best, to play to their utmost, to, to accomplish these marvelous things that all of us are capable of in one way or another, that teaches us that there are changes that can be made. But as Steve could tell you even better than I, because he did have to do so much of the work, there's a time for everything under the sun. And your work is important so that those who are in office at that time that arrives, you can seize, the, those of us who were, are there can seize the moment. Steve? Yeah, I think the, 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 I think the focus of activity should be in cities and in the states at this point, because I'm not sure that the Congress and the administration in DC is a doctor that you really want a very sick patient to go to. <laughs> that if they were to open up the ADA and get in there, who knows what they would do with it. I think yes. the ADA has established some basic lines of uh, authority, some right. legal situations, and so it's in cities and to some degree in states where some of that uh, that's continuing can, can, yep. can change and take, take place. And just, but before we I just want to honor one person that almost is never brought up when we talk about ADA, and that's Senator Edward Kennedy. Ted Kennedy was the chair of the, of the committee that you served on, and it was his desire to make sure that the ADA was 100% bipartisan. So he was the one, even though they could have rammed a version of ADA through, he said, no, this bill is so important that everybody needs to be involved. And it's just a remarkable. If you drop back another 15 years before the ADA, the Civil Rights Act was trying to come through the US Senate and was being filibustered, and I must point out, by Democrats. Democrats were filibustering the Civil Rights Act, Southern Democrats, and so times change. Who's in charge changes, but his desire to say the best ADA is the one that the most people are engaged in, yep. activists and uh, I, I, yeah. we've been in some rallies and you've been in some rallies where everybody says, uh, what do we want? Blank. When do we want it? Now. <laughs> There's certain <laughs> things that you have to wait a little while, that now you can't get the best product now. Sometimes you need to take some time to make sure that you do it right. And, and having thought for 20 years before I, thank God, retired, um, <laughs> I, I can't miss the opportunity to, to fortify what you said about um, change starting at the community level, and that changes what the state legislature will do, and that will influence what the Congress will do. So this is just, that, I, I, don't get me started, because I, I use this usually teaching my health MBA students about the many things that started right in this community, and then it became state legislation, and then somebody in Washington, D.C. claimed credit for it, you know, and, and, and got their name, and they got to sit like I sat at some event, you know, 25 years later, maybe. But these things all start with you. They always do. They always do. Nobody goes to Washington and invents any of this stuff. It all starts with you. It's like the... the, the Washington is, has, has got the directional flow of the Mississippi River going the wrong way. They think well, all the smart people, all the money, all the resources are in Washington, D.C., and then we tend to tell the states and the cities what to do when it's exactly the opposite. What happens in the cities and the states and the communities yep. makes its way into the legislative process if, if we listen well enough, and that's the... The quality of the ADA is it was an incredible grassroots achievement that ended up being ratified in, in DC. We have a question here in the back. Yeah. Um, you know, when I've seen stuff go through legislator, legislator, legislatures before, um, I've noticed even uh, despite uh, partisan differences, there's often just uh, tension between. Um, legislators and the executive branch. And I'm wondering if you have any examples of how you resolve that tension when you're moving the ADA through Congress. 
Well, it was, um, it was remarkable because the leadership of the Congress was Robert Byrd, who was the Democratic yeah. leader, Jim Wright was the Speaker of the House, and George W. George H. W. Bush was the President of the United States. And so there was something in the way in which those relationships, they fought about a lot of things. And I think Senator Kennedy had something to do with that, and Senator Dole had something so to Bob do with that Dole. as well, yeah. mm -hmm. is to kind of put that together. And maybe it wasn't in, in any, uh, uh, any kind of a direct conversation, but they say, we know that there's supposed to be an adversarial relationships between the branches, but not on this one. Yeah. No. Let's fight over taxes and foreign policy. Let's grind the gears in terms of there's some value to the country to do that. But at least as far as this one, this is one. This is one, is too important for the standard monkey business that we normally go through. So yeah. in part, it was a it was a, a relational kind of the way in which they talked to each other. And uh, Justin Dart was a famous huh. industrialist. Uh, cerebral palsy, I think, was his. Yep. And was very had been very instrumental in Bush's campaigns and so forth. Then pulled him aside and said, "I know the way in which you probably want to approach that, but you can't do that with this bill." And so there was kind of like a, a uh, kind of a, 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 yeah. a Swiss declaration of, of non-combating as they went through. But partly that's uh, that's that's a part well, of the activist yeah. role as well. I, I'm glad you responded that way because. I wasn't quite sure how where I'd head in on this one with my, but um, it also tells you something about the nature of the Senate and the nature of the House. Um, and the founding fathers, well, let me just give you an illustration. When I first got to the Senate, and I didn't expect to be going there, but I, I went, and, and I thought I'd be a governor, and I ended up in the Senate. But Russell Long was chairman of the Finance Committee, and I was on the Finance Committee before I ever was on the floor of the Senate, and he explained something to me about the difference between the Senate and the House. He said, you know, the House is there every two years they run for re-election because they're the ones that, you know, get the flavor of what's going on out there, the public opinion. And But the Founding Fathers realized that um, if we, you and I were sitting here, this was 1978, 79, you and I were sitting here talking about doing a windfall profits tax on the fact that oil prices went through the roof in 1979, and so there'd be a windfall profit tax to take some of that profit out and give it to poor people so they could heat their homes with the high-priced heating oil. And he said, Dave, Senator Dave, all we do in Louisiana is produce oil and gas, and all your constituents in Minnesota do is burn it. <laughs> so guess who wins? <laughs> and I got that, oh geez, you know, what am I doing here, look? <laughs> and he said, but wait, no. They decided there should be two of us from every state, and when every state is heard from, we get good national energy policy, good national tax policy. And I've never forgotten that. And that's that's part of that lesson here is that when the Senate goes armed to conference with the House with a 93 to 7 vote, it's pretty hard for some of those folks from the House who might like to pull this out or pull that out or change this or change that to get it done. Dan. I was right. just going to say a couple things that really made me think of uh, it's such a people business. You know, you had Doyle, who was disabled, back, and you had the Kevies, who had a disabled sister. And it's kind of like it is today when we're trying to find jobs for people. You, you kind of tend to look for employers who have people in their family with disabilities who are more, who are more either open-minded to it or sympathetic or understanding. And I always wonder if that was part of it as well, that because they, well, they lived it. I to share this moment that he just alluded to. This is the final passage day in the Senate after those thousand meetings. And it's the regular Senate chamber and everybody kind of is in there and they have a re reporters, stenographers that are recording everything that says. And Senator Harkin, the manager of the bill from Iowa said, I'm going to do something extraordinary, unusual, and I've kind of, but I've let everybody know. And so we got to him, the, the, the part of his speech, the central part of his speech is he just got out his hands and signed about 20 minutes of his speech. <laughs> and just remembered what that moment was like. And yeah. word spreads, 
and the galleries start filling up and yeah. senators kind of come on a little train over there. So we all sat there in the U.S. Senate chamber in silence as Senator Harkin went through that portion of his speech. And he just finished and he said, for those of you who don't speak American Sign Language, what I just said. <laughs> but it was so personal because of his nephew yeah. or brother or brother. a family member and the kind of the way in which it had t there was a personal part of the story. So yeah, it was legislation. Yeah, it was court decisions. Yeah, it was legislative language, on and on and on. But it was very, very personal. And personal was really, really good. And Dan's question reminds us also the fact that the, the other really interesting part of this is before it ever gets to the floor, you're in a committee. And a committee is roughly equally divided between Republicans and Democrats. And as Steve's already indicated, Ted Kennedy is, is chair of that committee. But in the, at the committee level, as you're proposing amendments that came from your state or that came from you know, the people that influence you, um, everybody's tuned in. I mean, everybody's paying attention because there is a personality to each of these sets of words that become part of the law. There's a story. There's a whole bunch of human beings. It isn't statistics. You know? It isn't some great economist lecturing us on you know, the Laffer curve or, <laughs> or Keynesian something or other. It's human beings. And it's both their accomplishments and their potential that people talk about at that, at that level. And Kennedy was so good at, at hearings when we had public witnesses of giving us an opportunity to learn, not from the association of this, that, or the other thing all the time, but from individual human beings who were there, not to go to Washington, D.C., but there to, interview, in, to change the future for their kids and their grandkids. That's what's really neat about this. We had one of the staff meetings early on, and I can remember being, this was before that you were involved. This was back in my Waker days. And Senator Kennedy said, you know what putting a good piece of legislation together is like? I'll dispense with the Boston accent. But he said, it's a lot like playing the accordion. And I thought, what does a Kennedy know about an accordion? But he said, first you bring it out, and then you squeeze. And then you bring it out, and then you squeeze. He said, that's how we're going to do the ADA. We're going to open it up and bring everybody in to give their point, and then we're going to squeeze it down because a group of a 1,000 of us can't make a decision. So we're going to squeeze it down to a few, but then we're going to open it up again, and then we're going to squeeze yeah, it down yeah. again, and this legislation is going to be a beautiful piece of music is the way in which he yeah. described it. So that was his approach to legislating yeah. all the way through that, you know, um, uh, part of the reason why we had so meetings is because we, every meeting we had, we had the main meeting, and we had a pre-pre-meeting, and then a pre-meeting, and then the meeting, and then a post-meeting, and a post-meeting, and the post-post-meeting. Yeah. So the, our, the, the shorthand was, uh, if you've only been invited to one meeting on a subject in a day, <laughs> you're being used. <laughs> is the way in which we talked about it. I mean, because because we're kind of manipulating all the kind of way through. But uh, but I I don't know. I just I just uh, I just hope we can find the endurance and the patience to kind of be able to approach big challenges in that way in the future. Can you imagine Alyssa's challenge being married to the son of this guy? Yeah. <laughs> we got about um, when ADA was passed. My sister had MS in advanced stages, and she constantly had to fight to get ADA compliance uh, in building construction, even government buildings. When they were constructed, they did not meet ADA compliance. They were not accessible to her. Here in St. Paul, what systems do you have in place to ensure that ADA is complied with in all constructions, in the city, as far as the streets. All of that occurs without people having to fight for implementation. You're, I think, yeah. Okay. All, all we did was crack the champagne bottle across yeah. the bow of this thing, and how it sails 
is up to right to me. Um, I'm the ADA coordinator for the city of St. Paul, and so I don't know all the answers to every single requirement. But what I do is coordinate a representative from every department within the city, so that if we do, so I'm sort of the first per point of contact. So someone doesn't need to call 15 people, like I bet your sister did, to even find who was supposed to even get the, the party started, right? The bus rolling, and so that in the city of St. Paul, that's the role that I play. And then I have a team of people from every department in the city. And so we have a nice system to track it. We have a nice way to get the word out. Throughout the years, I've developed relationships with lots of people in the disability community. So that's what here in the city of St. Paul we do. Um, and so that's what's beautiful. You get the legislation, but right, the implementation is so important. Any follow-up questions? If they don't comply, mm -hmm. then what are the penalties? What happens if they don't comply? Is what's the teeth there to find them enormous amounts of money? Whatever you would need to do to ensure that they do comply. And for example, architects are trained to, to when they construct buildings, they know the ADA, they mm -hmm. make sure that those buildings are in compliance. And so there's two approaches to compliance. One is the internal process I described. So as a city, as the city of St. Paul, we have this mechanism. We have trainings for, for various experts in order to understand the requirements. And then enforcement for those that aren't within city government. Um, your daughter, for example, our office, the St. Paul Department of Human Rights and Equal Economic Opportunity, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, those are other bodies through which people can file disc uh, discrimination complaints, failure to accommodate complaints, and that's one way that people can also get remedies through settlements or they can file in court as well. But the reality is, you know, I live fairly close to Grand Avenue. <laughs> you know? The reality is we've all got to be on at all times. Because um, sometimes people in elected office get really busy and they got really important things they got to go to and got to go off to this, got to go to that, got to go to a meeting, da 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 da. And it's kind of hard to get your issue in there at a time in which it's going to make a difference. And if it didn't happen that time, then you come back and do it the next time. This, um, we're 285,000 people here in St. Paul. And um, as you could tell from the, the smiles in the room when I mentioned the Grand <laughs> Avenue meters, we occasionally f get together and get a lot of visibility. But most of the time, and you're making the point, what we have that we know should be changed doesn't have a lot of visibility except to just a few people. And so you need the rest of us to help you in, in that. And the only, you know, ultimately we have the elections, but between times, you know, there's something going on now called Make St. Paul Strong, S-T-R-O-N-G, and each of those stands for something that all relates to your, to your uh, question. And it's, a, it's an appropriate one that all of us, no matter uh, where we sit and live in this community, we all have to take the responsibility on our own shoulders at some point to make sure that upstairs is paying attention. Yeah, I like how somebody tell me you can really tell a real old St. Paul person is that they would feel a lot better if Grand Avenue was renamed Pretty Good Avenue. <laughs> Grand is a little... <laughs> so, uh, we're about done with our little section. Maybe, Claudia, have you got... got a question for you. Because... Okay. Okay. Because like you were saying, people are th taking things for granted now that everything should be accessible. But I, all the time I hear it costs too much money, costing too much money, we can't do it. Now with the new folks coming in to Senate, uh, government, stuff like that, how can we, all of us, get together to make sure that ADA stays strong, nothing gets taken away, and we can improve the ADA in the future? Thank you. I've always described Washington, D.C. as a city of 500 issues and about six priorities. And so it's a constant battle of going to D.C. and just being an issue. Because it's not something that, and so that that's part of its letters you write. It's showing up at candidate forums. It's uh, when a candidate puts out their legislature. I, I noticed candidate for governor or senator or the House of Representatives, there's, there's no mention of disabilities or ADA in your literature. I notice when you give your inaugural address or you kind of give your 
uh, closing statement at your debate that you didn't mention it, is to call them on it, is to say this is very important, and, and, and it's not just important to those who have disabilities, it's important to absolutely everyone. That's the point of it. It's, it's for the good of everyone. And uh, so I think you just have to be just <coughs> short of annoying <laughs> in your advocacy of this position. You so probably should be annoying, too. <laughs> <laughs> if, you, if you've got a special gift for being annoying, I suppose you yeah, know. Right. Might but as well. It's kind of the thing Use where it. it's, it's, uh, they, should, they should see your face in an event and know yeah. that, that know the first question that they're going to ask that you're going to ask yeah. them that question and it just raises yeah. it in their own hearts and minds. Yeah. So anyway, sorry we talked so much and didn't provide oh. enough time for enough questions, but it was fun. Wait, do you have any final remarks you want to make? Or? Um, I'm not forcing you. What? Final, <laughs> oh. final remarks? Or? Well, I think the, 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 the sense that I'm getting from this this uh, group is that nobody here is anxious to go eat. But um, the, other, the other one is um, a lesson that I learned from watching my wife research um, the history of deinstitutionalization of, of uh, what used to be called our mental institutions in Minnesota. And the lessons that she learned and I learned, and we go to Fergus Falls or Hastings or places like that, and we talk to people that used to work there. And we warehouse people with disabilities. We warehouse the elderly that were too hard to take care of because of some old timer's disease or something like that. We warehouse everybody. And when they passed on, we buried them with a number. That was in my lifetime in Minnesota. That was in my lifetime in Minnesota. So I sit here and I rejoice to have played a little bitty role in the progress that we've made since she, from this time she's describing in 1946, 47, 48, and it wasn't changed by some politician. It was changed by people that worked in those places. It was changed by people that had families and relatives in those places. They're the ones who made the Luther Youngdahl then, the governor and the legislature, change that system. Have we improved it a lot? Yeah, we've improved it somewhat but we still have a lot of problems. And if it weren't for the people in this room, we wouldn't be able to have some confidence in the people that we elect will deal with those when it requires them to do that. So thank you all very much for coming out. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Great job. Great job. Um, and I know you, someone was asking, I'm even glad I was asking about, uh, you know, making sure ADA continues. That's why we have our, our committees like we're all sitting on to make sure those things happen. And I know they have them in every city. So what we'd like to do is move on um, because it is almost quarter two. And uh, did you want um, to? I can do without that mic. Okay, go ahead. We'd like to welcome at this time uh, Dan Reed from Partnership Resources. Coordinator also of the Minneapolis St. Paul Real Abilities Film Festival, a former member of the Mayor's Committee in St. Paul for People with Disabilities. He will now show three short films that were locally produced. Welcome, Dan. Great. Nice to see you all, everybody. Just a couple of quick things. Um, oh, great. Perfect. Um, I was on, the a on this committee when it was really call almost called the ADA Committee, where we went out and we educated the community on ADA issues. That's really how it all started. It was part of the, I think it was part of the original amendment. But uh, I was laughing because I worked for two Coleman's. I was on the committee so long, I was on for Storm and Norman Coleman and then uh, the Chris. So it's really great to be here. And I, at Old Home Week. And I just want to give you a little background about real abilities. Um, we, uh, I work with adults with disabilities, and we got involved with the film business kind of by accident. We actually listened to one of our clients and asked her what she wanted to do, and she said, I want to be on stage. Well, if you ask someone what they want to do, you better come through with it. Well, we started a little acting troupe, and it ended up doing, we did, a, we did the play uh, The Wizard of Oz, and it was so well received that someone came up and said, this story should be told. And so... I said, well, we always wanted to do a documentary. So we did the play Hairspray as a reality show and called it Born for the Stage, and it won awards all over the country. And we saw how 
it changed people's perception of people with disabilities. And when we were in New York, we went to a, uh, the Manhattan Film Festival, and we, and we did very well there. We met the people of real abilities, and we thought, we got to bring that to Minnesota because we saw the power of film. Because one in one changes one person. When you can have it on a TV station, it changes hundreds of thousands. And so, so we brought real abilities to the Twin Cities, and we wanted to bring it to St. Paul because St. Paul is a totally cool city. And uh, honestly, we needed a space that was unique, and the unique uh, the un uniqueness of the uh, of the Union Depot is the fact that you can have limitless wheelchairs there. There are very few theaters in this in anywhere that you can have thirty to fifty to sixty wheelchairs in an event, and everyone feels welcome. And so we did it at Union Depot. It was extremely well received. People loved the accessibility. It was r terrifically designed, and so. Uh, we partnered with public television and we said, why don't we do a more of a Minnesota connection? So we did a challenge to Min uh, Minnesota filmmakers of all abilities. And we just wanted a short, five minutes or less, what life is like for people with disabilities in Minnesota. But oh, it'd be so cool if we got 10 or 12, 15 videos. We got 50. And the top 14 were selected by a, it was, uh, a juried professionals, thank God it wasn't me in my garage, trying to pick out which film would be great to show. And, um, and TPT did a television show called All, of Make, uh, All of Billy's uh, Filmmaker Showcase. And it appears rather, in fact, it's on this weekend on, pu on public television. And by the way, Born for the Stage shows about once every six weeks on public television. So. So it's kind of fun. So I want to show you a couple of films, and uh, I welcome some comments. I think I'm only show two films because I want to get your reactions. And it was great because Senator Dave was talking about the state hospitals. The first film we're going to show is about one of our clients who lived in one of the state hospitals. And she was dying. She came to PRI and was there for years, public PR where I work. And she was dying and she frantically wanted her story told. So she wrote it, but she didn't have time to do it herself. So she passed away this winter, so her friends did it for her. It's called Andy's story. I know she's in a better place where she's not in pain anymore. She doesn't have to worry about um, life's on earth difficulties or worries anymore. She can go wherever she, she likes to be and she can be free. Today we are here to share the story of Andrea's Fang, written in her own words. My name is Andrea Fang and I have cerebral palsy. At age three, I was studied at St. Barris Hospital for a week and eventually determined to be a mentally deficient person. This is the first time the doctors tried to convince my parents to have me committed. My family fought to keep me living at home while I attended Michael Dowling School for Crippled Children for eight years. By 1963, at age 16, I was institutionalized in Faribault State School and Hospital. I don't think a day has gone by that we haven't relived a memory from Andy's life or what she did for us um, or what she meant to PRI. I miss Andy every day and, and I know her memory will last uh, in PRI and, and throughout the community uh, for years to come. Because of my physical speech impairment, it was assumed that my intellect was minimal. This caused me to be housed with patients much below my functioning level, who were often treated more poorly than those who could report their conditions. While at Faribault, I rarely saw staff or teachers. Patients were maintained to a bare minimum. Once a week, we were all put in the shower room and hosed down. If you had the ability to wash yourself, you were lucky. At night, everyone was strapped to their metal cribs. 
giant rooms filled with row after row of these bed cages held adults of all functioning levels through the through the scream and clinch filled night there was not privacy decency or respect towards the end of my stay the doctors decided i needed experimental surgery on my legs to undo my disease despite my refusal it was done i never walked again A picture is worth a thousand words. Andy's smile is worth a million words. Never in my life have I seen anyone with a better attitude. And I've been around the block. Andy is one of those people that you get to meet in your life, one of those very few people that you go, oh my goodness, she's one of the finest people I've ever known. And to learn from her and to live with her and to enjoy art with her really transforms me as a person and as I always looked at people with disabilities and their art. Cheers to her. Cheers to Andy. I have lived a long life working every second to overcome obstacles no one should have to endure. Finally, we have the resources, manpower, and ability to ensure that every human, no matter how able, be treated equally. People first. It was about six years ago we started with the Highland Friendship Club looking for more summer programs that would uh, be beneficial to the members. Get in action, bear glove, clap your chest. Give it and then we had this idea for the movies. We had, I think, 12 to 15 members really involved in the first couple of movies, and then it just kept blossoming. Oh, just go all the way back. All the way back. Yeah, I, got, I, got. I call up all the actors that I'm interested in, in having major parts. Here's some ideas I have. Can you piggyback off that and give me more ideas? Come one, come all, come the greatest show. Last year we added a, uh, an entire circus sideshow uh, just after some of the members' ideas. Another student really wanted to go into a, a hot air balloon, and so we developed hot air balloon pirates. So we, we had these you know, brainstorming sessions where we'd talk about the character. I'd draw them out as they were talking about what they liked and what they didn't, and they got to you know, tell me, too dark or too light, or I want a hood or I don't. And then we put the underland splash on it with the stripes. Libby is one of our one of our excellent characters. She plays Suki. She's in love with dogs. She developed this dog costume kind of deal with a fun fuzzy hat. Your dog? He chose me. Last year we had our first night class for Movie Magic 101, teaching the very basics of filmmaking. We try to give them a, a taste of everything. It gives them more confidence. The favorite part of the movie is get the costumes ready and also get the people ready. So we ended up deciding after the first year to go with all ADR, so all recorded after the fact. And I'd be able to work with them to coach them into saying the right things and using inflection. Hey, who are you calling simple? Hey, who are you calling simple? If you're a, if you're a parent or a PCA or just there to watch, you're gonna get thrown into a costume and pretty much be on scene because they can work side by side with 
the person that they're helping, and you can't tell. Keep working it, doing so good. With the original story, we thought, hey, why not use some original music? Larry McDonough, the parent of one of the members, is a great musician. Working with him, we came up with just an amazing piece that really allowed our members um, to really show off their abilities. A reason to shine. We always have some kind of a, a theme or some kind of a, a moment in the movie that's designed to spur conversation. We wanted to make people gasp and get uncomfortable because it's not always comfortable in talking about people with disabilities in the, our world today. We're talking about bullying and using uh, violence. <laughs> Lucian um, is kind of playing a bad guy. Talking with the actor, he wanted to explore that and find out you know, more about himself, more about his social interactions. And he came up to me after the filming of it and said, you know, I, I used to be a bully, but I think I can change now. I, I know I can change. I saw it happen. I do want your power, but not in a way you will it. So the premiere is just an amazing event. It's pretty much the reason why a lot of people even get involved in this, is to see these awesome actors shine on the red carpet and up on stage accepting awards. They get to look around and see all of their, their friends and family that have come to, to watch, and it's just an amazing buzz, an amazing feeling being in that auditorium. I've seen some of our actors get acting jobs out of state, like as actual paid actors. Um, other things I see are confidence, big time confidence. Wait, what? Oh my God! Oh. Um, getting people to start speaking up for themselves and doing things for themselves, it gives them such a, a great outlook for social interaction. This is my costume. It, it. Kept telling me, don't do that much. Keep it simple. Who wants easy, really? <laughs> I mean, these guys have been through some pretty hard moments in their lives. Nothing's really come easy. People came in expecting something a little less, and when they see all these crazy cyborgs and, and weird costumes and, and crazy makeup. They start realizing that these guys with significant disabilities can do so much more. It's time for those who've been oppressed to rise up and take back their freedom! Get, get your body, body, mo, mo, moving. Get, get your body, body, mo, mo, moving. Get, get your body, body, mo, mo, moving. Thank you, Dan. I want, to, I want to thank everybody for coming here today, and I want to thank Senator Berger and Steve Moore and Dan Reed and the mayor, who's doing another meeting right about now. Uh, and so thank you all, and we want to make sure that uh, St. Paul stays, you know, the most livable city in America, as the, lo uh, as the logo says, and that is a one-size-fits-all, by the way. So that is even people with disabilities. So uh, thank you all for coming. <laughs>